Hello, I'm Anna Whitty, I'm Chichester City's Planning Advisor. I've put this video together to give residents an introduction to the planning system and hopefully this will help put the Chichester neighbourhood plan that we're preparing into context. If you want to get involved in the neighbourhood plan, you can join our Facebook page, search groups for Chichester City Neighbourhood Plan and uh, on our website chichestercity.gov.uk forward slash neighbourhood hyphen plan. In the meantime, this presentation gives a brief background and overview of our planning system, um, what it's for, how it came about and how it works. The purpose of the planning system is to achieve sustainable development and sustainable is defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Planning aims to balance the social, economic and environmental needs of our society in a sustainable way. So how does it do that? It's a plan-led system and this means each local planning authority draws up a local plan with policies about what type of development is or is not in the public interest and where. So this is based on government policies and evidence they collate about the needs of local people and the constraints of the area. These planning policies are evidence-based statements of what is or is not in the public interest in their area. So planning applications are assessed against these policies and any other material considerations. A material consideration is something that affects a matter of public interest uh, but may not be covered adequately or at all by a specific policy. The default position on a planning application is to permit it. An application can only be refused if the planning authority can demonstrate that permitting it would cause harm to matters of public interest and that le the level of harm would justify the refusal. The planning system cannot protect private interests. It cannot consider one party's personal, financial or private interests over another. If a proposed development would increase land value or decrease the value of neighbouring land, that's not a material consideration and can't be taken into account. Similarly, a person's private view from their own property is not a material consideration. But an important view from a public place can be. Noise and privacy can be tricky because to a certain extent everybody has a different tolerance or expectation and the material consideration is whether or not the impact of the noise or the overlooking goes beyond normal expectations. The planning authority is not making and cannot make a judgement on how significantly the development would impact you as an individual. They can only consider how much of an impact the development would have on the average person if they lived in your property. So it's about protecting the land use, the use of your house as a dwelling. It doesn't go as far as necessarily protecting you to the level of noise or overlooking that you personally are used to or would be comfortable with. At the heart of the planning system is the presumption in favour of sustainable development. This phrase was written into the Government National Planning Policy Framework, the NPPF, which was brought in in 2012 during the last radical shake-up of the planning system. But in practice this principle has been the unwritten rule in planning ever since its inception. Planning was never supposed to be a burden to developers, it was never supposed to stop or delay them. So how did our planning system come about? In the 1800s, with no planning system in place, industrialisation brought a huge population shift from the countryside, where the work had traditionally been in agriculture and food production, to cities where more labour was now needed in factories mass producing goods. So this created an issue of conflicting land uses where overcrowded slum housing was affected by adjacent fume spilling factories by the late 1800s, some entrepreneurs like Bourneville and Cadbury had planned towns or worker villages where good quality worker housing was provided appropriately sited in relation to the factories. But for most individual um, workers, this was unattainable and slum housing and poor conditions were the norm. By the turn of the century, Ebenezer Howard founded the Garden City Movement, which later became the Royal Town Planning Institute, the RTPI. 
He promoted the principle of planning towns to have the benefits of the countryside such as fresh air and good quality housing, alongside the benefits of cities such as proximity to work and amenities. But there was strong resistance to introducing any system which could be an impediment to developers building on their own land, and it was almost 50 years until a system of planning and development control was brought in under the 1947 Planning Act. An Englishman's home is his castle, and it was a huge social adjustment to accept the principle that planning permission should be sought for the development you wanted to carry out on your own land, regardless of the impact that development had on surrounding land uses. However, with the end of the Second World War and the push for homes fit for heroes for returning soldiers, there was an acceptance of the need for a planning system to deliver good quality, appropriately sited housing and business to protect the public interest. So, the planning system was introduced somewhat hesitantly and seen by some as a real infringement on what they considered should be their unfettered right as landowners to build on their own land as they wished. The 1947 Planning Act effectively removed this right and required planning permission for new development and this included buildings as well as changes of use of the land. By the 1960s societal attitudes were changing and the public wanted their say on planning decisions rather than automatically trusting council appointed experts. In 1968 the RTPI observed that planning is unpopular with many members of the public. This we and they attitude, we being the public at the mercy of they, the planners, is all too prevalent and is indicative of the extent to which public participation is not being achieved at present. The 1968 Planning Act gave the public the right to be consulted on planning decisions, but this didn't fundamentally change the us and them system of councils making the rules in the form of their local plans and then determining planning applications on that basis. It's a top-down approach where the council must consult the public, but it holds all the cards in terms of decision-making. The 2004 Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act replaced the previous planning acts, but didn't change anything about the top-down planning system. This act states that all planning decisions must be made in accordance with the development plan, which is the local plan and any adopted planning policies unless material planning considerations indicate otherwise in this specific circumstance. At this point in the 2000s, the societal attitudes and expectations about regulations have changed massively. In the early 1900s, if you owned some land, you decided what to do with it. If you run a factory, your food or goods were produced to your own standards. If you employed staff, you could pay them and set their conditions however you wished. The planning system was born into that kind of culture right at the start of the regulatory era that we're now in. Now regulations cover most aspects of people's lives and people expect to have to get permission before they do anything. They also expect that they will be protected through regulation from anything that might impact them. When people's lives are impacted by something, they often ask, why was this allowed to happen? Not why did it happen, but why was it not prevented by some regulation? In many cases, if some harm befalls you, you might even be able to pursue a legal case against those responsible. So the default position for the average person in society has completely changed from expecting freedom from regulations in most situations to expecting extensive regulation to protect them from any harm or any unwanted impact. The planning system hasn't reflected this change in societal expectation. The planning system is not designed or purposed to protect individuals from the impacts of development. It's designed to, prote to prevent development which is harmful to the wider public interest. Some development may cause significant harm to local amenity, uh, the ability of people to enjoy their surroundings, but ultimately may still be in the public interest because there is a national need for it. So this might particularly be the case for large-scale construction for house building or other purposes. Seeing the huge impacts this kind of development can have on residents in the immediate vicinity, people often wonder how could this have been allowed? But it's because the planning system isn't there to protect you as an individual. It's there to protect the wider public interest. Society needs that function or that development 
and it has to go somewhere. So you are being affected, but it's for the greater good. You might be thinking, is there anything I can do about it? And I'd say your best bet is to take part in the decision making at the earliest possible opportunity. Once an application is submitted, the planning authority has the duty to determine it in accordance with their policies and material considerations. So to have the most effective influence, you need to have your say when policies are being written. Local plans are reviewed every five years and local authorities do consult on their policies, although by the time they consult about their draft policies, you may feel like they've already, uh, they already have a certain direction. Do they have to listen to me? Do I have any power here? And the local authority doesn't have to get the approval of its residents to adopt the local plan. But you can get involved in policy development right at the beginning through neighbourhood plans. They were introduced through the Localism Act of 2011 and they are developed by the residents, usually through the parish council, who will shape the public's needs and preferences into an adoptable plan. Once adopted, the neighbourhood plan is legally part of the development plan, equal in law to local plans. So all planning decisions must be made in accordance with neighbourhood plan policies, unless overriding material considerations apply. Both plans should be compatible, but where there is any discord in specific requirements, the most recently adopted will take precedence. What's new and different about neighbourhood plans is that they're not the council's plans, they are the residents' plans. So this fundamentally changes the power balance in planning from the us and them top-down system to a system whereby for the first time residents can have real influence over the policies shaping their local area as they're being developed and written. The residents decide what to include in the plan. There are limitations, policies must be um, underpinned with evidence showing they're justified and in the public interest and must be broadly in accordance with local plan strategic policies such as housing numbers. Once a neighbourhood plan is produced, a referendum is held across the parish to give residents the final say on whether to adopt it. So the Chichester neighbourhood plan is our residence plan. The role of the City Council is to facilitate our residents to develop your own plan. We'll take you through the process from start to finish. We've done a survey which has given us a steer on some of the issues and we're following those up with some technical work, um, a trees and green spaces study, options for carbon reduction and options for our road network. And now we need to open things up and get you started on planning for Chichester. We're releasing our online training soon on our website and Facebook page explaining how we make a neighbourhood plan and then we'll be setting up socially distanced working groups and we'll take all that input and do any technical work like collating data or getting any specialist reports and then we'll work with you to develop this into a plan with your priorities and solutions um, into justified and evidenced policies and other aspirations. So we'll make sure the finished plan covers everything it needs to and meets all the statutory requirements so it can go to the referendum and you can vote to adopt it. In taking this role as facilitator, the City Council accepts that our residents will be the ones to determine the content of the plan and not every single policy will necessarily coincide with ones we might have chosen ourselves. This in many ways is the whole point of this type of plan, that's what's really important about it. In that sense it's different to any other project or plan that the Council undertakes. For the first time in the history of the planning system in this country, our residents have been given the opportunity to have a genuine, meaningful impact on development in their area from the earliest stages of policy making. After 70 years of councils writing planning policies, our residents are taking up the pen. Good luck! Join us on our Facebook group, Chichester City Neighbourhood Plan. See our website chichestercity.gov.uk forward slash neighbourhood hyphen plan or email me at neighbourhood.plan at chichestercity.gov.uk.